Good morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. This is the Fast Friday edition of the show for May 29th, 2020. Today on this episode, we're commemorating not just one, not two, but three important historic events. First of all, it's Patrick Henry's birthday. It's also the anniversary of his introduction of the Virginia Resolutions or Virginia Resolves against the Hated Stamp Act. And tomorrow, the anniversary of his famous If This Be Treason speech. We'll get to that in a moment. But first of all, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 930 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Quick programming note, I will be off next week, Monday at least. I'm in the middle of a move, and I'm setting up my new apartment and home office, but I'll be back later in the week. You can find all of our archives, all of the show notes, all the links to important stuff that I mentioned in each episode, plus all the platforms we're on, both video, live streaming, and archive, and audio-only podcast editions. Plus, you can find our social media platforms, our email newsletters, and ways to support us, like our membership program, which starts out as little as two bucks a month, and we make it go a long, long way here at the TAC. You can find all that and more at the show homepage over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And I am extremely grateful for your interest in spending some time learning about these important historical events with me today. But since it's Fast Friday, I promise to not take up too much of your time. Let's see if I can get this done in about 15 minutes or less. But I'll do my very best to see how I can knock this out. First of all, let's start this out. This guy, I'm pulling up the image on the screen. Today in history, May 29th, 1736, Patrick Henry was born. He was a pretty polarizing figure, especially during the ratification debates over the Constitution, 1788, the summer of 1788, and even after. Now, he and James Madison, for example, they had a long-standing rivalry, and Thomas Jefferson wasn't even a fan of his either. But Henry commanded respect and even fear from his opponents due to the fact that he was considered by many to be possibly the greatest order of his time. And here, Thomas Jefferson himself puts it, in some notes on Patrick Henry, I think it was 1812 or so, talking about his speaking capabilities. And Jefferson writes, another of the great occasions on which he exhibited examples of eloquence, such as probably had never been exceeded, greatest in history, according to Jefferson, an opponent, not a fan of Patrick Henry, we'll put it that way, saying that Henry's skill had never been exceeded was on the question of adopting the new constitution in 1788, primarily in June in the Virginia ratifying convention. To this, Jefferson writes, he was most violently opposed, as is well known. And after its adoption, he continued hostile to it, expressing more than any other man in the U.S. Now, as far as his speeches, I also want to touch on this important one and hear from an article by my buddy Joe Wolverton that we published last July. He writes, there was a time in our history when one of our finest patriot fathers is said to have waved the saber of treason in the face of the world's most powerful monarch. In return, his fellow Burgesses, Joe writes, exclaimed that the patriot himself was the one committing treason. That brave and some would say, given the circumstances, reckless man was the incomparable Patrick Henry. Now, mind you, on May 29th, 1765, the day of his 29th birthday, think of this. I mean, when I was 29 years old, I was irresponsible. There's no way I could ever, I had, there are very few 29-year-olds alive. There are very few people who have lived much longer, probably no one alive today, with the skill and passion and dedication to liberty that Patrick Henry had. This is a very rare individual, 29 years old. He offered five resolutions, actually seven, for consideration by the House of Burgesses against the Hated Stamp Act. And mind you, it's not like he had been in the House for a long time. He just took his oath of office like a week and a half. I think it was 10, 11 days earlier there in May. So he's a backbencher, although he was well-known Who knows? I mean, there was definitely an old conservative guard that didn't want any changes back then and resisted the new guard coming in. And so he had a, a kind of an uphill battle against him. But this is a man who rose to the occasion. And Joe continues writing. He says Henry had decided to offer not five, 
but seven resolutions after consulting with a couple of other people in response to the Stamp Act. Henry moved for the adoption of the seven resolutions by the Committee of the Whole. The motion was seconded by a guy named George Johnston, and the debate ensued. Now, I'm going to include this link in the show notes from constitution.org, which is the text of all the resolutions, including, uh, well, different versions, for example, that were published around the country. And these are the most interesting ones. I'm not going to read through all of them, but number four, I think, was pretty radical for the time. Resolve that his majesty's liege people of this, his most ancient and loyal colony, have without interruption enjoyed the inestimable an estimable right of being governed by such laws, respecting their internal polity and taxation as are derived from their own consent. This harkens to what ended up becoming the notion of delegated and reserve powers and popular sovereignty, the people of the several states. Those powers of internal polity, for example, would only be done by their own consent in their own colony. This was very radical for the time. And even more radical was number five, resolved that the General Assembly of this colony have the only and sole exclusive right and power to lay taxes and impositions upon the inhabitants of this colony. And that every attempt to vest such power in any person or persons whatsoever other than the General Assembly aforesaid, has a manifest tendency to destroy British as well as American freedom. And this is incredibly radical for the time. I mean, this is not an idea of sovereignty popular, although it really is a precursor to that, that the people held the power. At the time, the, the everyone thought of themselves as loyal subjects. And the notion that a 29-year-old kid adult, a 29-year-old fiery orator in Virginia could say to the king, to parliament, we have the sole right to make this choice. And if anyone tries to vest this power in you, the sovereign, it destroys freedom, both here in America and in Britain. That was incredibly, incredibly radical. Joe writes, these the seven resolutions, and I'll get to the other two later, they're very interesting, were passed by the Committee of the Whole and sent to the House, the full House, on May 30th. They were debated vociferously, and on May 30th, five of the first seven were approved, albeit by small margins, especially the fifth, which apparently passed by the narrowest of margins, a single vote. It was during the debate on this fifth and most contentious of the first five resolutions that Patrick Henry spoke words that have been passed into the lore of the early days of American discontent with English rule. So he's making the case for passage of this and telling the, the full house, like, we got to go with this. And we're taking the position in this resolution that, well, it doesn't matter. We're the only ones that have the sole and exclusive right and power to lay taxes on the people of this colony not the king, not parliament, not anybody else. And Henry went to this speech, and this is, uh, Joe is actually in his article, he is citing biographer William Wirt saying this, it was in the midst of this magnificent debate while he was descanting on the tyranny of the obnoxious act, the Stamp Act that is, that he exclaimed in a voice of thunder, and mind you, this is hinting, well, and with the look of a god, quote, Caesar had his Brutus, Charles I his Cromwell, and George III. I mean, basically, he's saying like, look, these tyrants, these despots, these monarchs, kings, well, they, they got something coming to them. And George III, well, if he doesn't do the right thing, maybe, well, who knows? And the implication was that Henry was advocating taking down the king. So treason, cried the speaker. Again, this from William Wirt. Treason, treason echoed from every part of the house. It was one of those trying moments which is decisive of character. And not many of us have the character of a of uh, Patrick Henry, probably none of us. And here he was at just 29 years old. Henry faltered not an instant, but rising to a loftier attitude and fixing on the speaker an eye of the most determined fire, he finished his sentence with the firmest emphasis. Again, taking it from George III, quote, may profit by their example. If this be treason, make the most of it. 
Now, we don't know, and even though this is part of early American history lore, and there's probably, <laughs> there's some version of this that actually happened. We don't know the exact words because there wasn't someone actually, there wasn't someone taking down word for word, transcribing what was happening. And it didn't happen until many years later. James Madison was trying to figure it out. Jefferson's cousin, for example, was trying to. And Joe writes about this. He says, while we may never know for sure what Patrick Henry said, we do know that at the end of the speech, a final binding vote was taken by the House. As stated above, the first five of the seven resolutions passed, the fifth only barely. By this time, the narrowness of the resolution's passage was inconsequential as their author had already become the voice of American resistance to English despotism. Just by making the speech because and introducing the resolutions, even though five of seven originally passed, then Henry was pretty kind of, and Murray Rothbard talks about this in Conceived in Liberty, that great now five volume set on early American history. He talks about how, well, Pen Henry was pretty content and he just left the next day on May 31st. And so the conservatives in charge at the time, the old guard basically voted to rescind that fifth resolution. So it didn't technically get passed. It was scrubbed from history. The first four passed. Number four was pretty, pretty radical for the time. Fifth didn't pass and six and seven actually didn't. So, and Joe writes that he said this left only the first four as officially adopted resolutions of the Virginia house. Now let's look at those last two. These were also introduced and there's some debate that maybe they weren't from Patrick Henry, but I, you know, let's say, let's go with Henry really was the fire behind this. Resolve, the inhabitants of this colony are not bound to yield obedience to any law or ordinance whatsoever designed to impose any taxation whatsoever upon them other than the laws or ordinances of the General Assembly aforesaid. This is a foreshadowing of nullification. It really is because he's basically saying like, look, if you pass something that you are not authorized to pass, then we are not bound to yield obedience to it. And that's really the same approach that Jefferson and Madison took decades later in 1798 in opposition to the Alien and Sedition Acts. It really is this idea, this principle of subsidiarity that the local, the local people do not have to follow these laws that are not authorized by the far off government. And number seven, and this one's pretty radical as well. Any person who shall, by speaking or writing, assert or maintain that any person or persons other than the General Assembly of this colony have any right or power to impose or lay any taxation on the people here shall be deemed an enemy to His Majesty's colony. So the interesting part is, is that all of these were widely printed. They were printed as if they all passed. I don't know if the, the newspapers actually said they passed, but there was a resistance and these were drafted by Patrick Henry and they were circulated. There's some varying versions of the text that were circulated in various newspapers around the country, but this really sparked a fire. It really, really moved people forward. And it even notes this over here on Wikipedia. A direct result of the publishing of the Virginia Resolves was a growing public anger over the Stamp Act. And according to several contemporary sources, the Resolves were responsible for inciting the Stamp Act riots. Governor Thomas Hutchinson of Massachusetts, of course we know, the resistance to the Stamp Act, Sons of Liberty, Samuel Adams, and the rest. This was a big deal there. Hutchinson said that, quote, nothing extravagant appeared in the papers till an account was received of the Virginia Resolves. Later, Edmund Burke linked the Resolves with the beginning of the opposition to the Stamp Act that would contribute to the American Revolution. And that's why one of the reasons that Patrick Henry was so important and so famous at that time. I just want to point out one quick other thing before we head out of here. This is really one of my favorite quotes from Patrick Henry. It was in the Virginia Ratifying Convention, June 7th, 1788. And I've got it here up on the screen, but let me read it in full. That government is no more than a choice among evils is acknowledged by the most intelligent, intelligent among mankind and has been a standing maxim for ages.
Well, I hope you guys found this as interesting as I did. I love learning about this stuff. I love going back to the early revolutionary days and find, I find the more that I do that, I'm finding the foundations for all the work that I've been doing here at the 10th Amendment Center for so much longer when I was really only focusing on ratification of the Constitution, but they didn't just get those principles, this idea that you're not bound to yield obedience, this idea of nullification, for example, as well. They didn't get that idea out of nowhere. Jefferson, Madison didn't make this up. This came from a long-standing tradition of resistance. And Patrick Henry was one of the people who really led that resistance starting back in 1765. Again, I hope you found this really interesting. I hope you found it educational. I hope you learned something. That's the most important I learn as I go. I will link to all these things over in the show notes over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Of course, if you support the show, you can take a bunch of free actions to help us out. Smashing the like button, subscribing, getting notifications leaving a review on iTunes or any other podcast platform you may find us on. That all helps us out because it triggers the algorithm of the platform you watch or listen on, and it tells that platform to show the program to more people. And of course, if you really want to pitch in, you can support us financially. Our membership program starts out as little as two bucks a month. That's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have a great weekend, and I'll see you later next week here on the path to liberty.